Dr. Melanie Thomas attended medical school at the UCB UCSF Joint Medical Program, where she received her MS in Health and Medical Sciences from UCB in 2004 and her MD from UCSF in 2006. She completed her residency in psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, where she served at the, at the CSFG Psychiatry Chief Resident in 2010 and a postdoctoral research fellowship with Nancy Adler, PhD, director of the UCSF Center for Health and Community. Dr. Thomas has been the recipient of the Public and Community Service Award from the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and the Health Disparities Loan Repayment Program from the National Institutes of Health. Since completion of her clinical and research training, she has held various roles at the ZSFG and as faculty within the UCSF Department of Psychiatry. Her primary focus is health services research and programmatic development in the area of perinatal mental health as a mechanism to interrupt the intergenerational transmission of stress and reduce health inequities. In addition to her current role as the Director of Solid Start Initiative at DSFG, she has served as the Principal Investigator for several community-engaged research projects related to development, implementation, and evaluation of mental health and other psychosocial services for pregnant women and families with children zero to three. Dr. Thomas has been recognized as an expert in perinatal mental health through presentations at a variety of national conferences, including the American Public Health Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the World Congress on Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. Dr. Thomas is the principal investigator on a research engagement award proposal through the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Without further ado, I present Dr. Melanie Thomas. Okay, please come down closer. Those of you that are here, we're in this enormous formal auditorium um, with a handful of folks way in the back, um, which is really not my preferred style. So thank you and come on down a little bit closer. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kate Margolis, for that lovely introduction. Um, and it's definitely my pleasure to be here giving the UCSF CAP Grand Rounds today. Um, so for my talk, uh, we have a few objectives um, which are behind you. One is to understand and be able to describe the significance of maternal mental health as a public health priority. The second is to describe the relationship between maternal mental health, social determinants of health, and disparities in birth outcomes. The third is to be familiar with a few innovative maternal mental health programs and policies at the local and state levels. And then lastly, um, just because it's sort of the way that I like to do talks, to know a little bit about me and my work and my own professional um, and personal trajectory. So um, we have all kinds of experts in the room, and I would imagine in the other rooms where this is being broadcast. Um, and I think I'm the only one that has a microphone, but I'd really like to ask others to answer this question, and I'll repeat what you say so everyone can hear you. So why maternal mental health as a window of opportunity to disrupt health disparities? Yes. Yep. Great. So you can come up and give my talk for me. <laughs> um, but basically talking about maternal mental health and how that links up with the child outcomes, the secure base, um, attachment, I'm not remembering what else. You said the ACEs framework. Anybody else want to chime in? Okay. So this is a um, systematic review that was done by Christine Dunkelshutter and uh, Dr. Tanner a few years back. So it's getting a little bit old now, but I really like the way that they conceptualize this intergenerational or transgenerational impact of maternal stress. One of the things that I really like about it, if you look over on the left side of your screen, they can you can see that they use some non-traditional um, descriptors of maternal mental health. So rather, you see sort of the expected categories of anxiety or depressive symptoms, 
But then you see these other things like major life events, chronic stress and racism, which have really been demonstrated throughout the literature to have a profound impact on the moms, obviously, um, but also the life course of the family. So in this uh, second set of boxes, the abbreviations stand for gestational age, preterm birth, low birth weight. So those are sort of our traditional OB adverse birth outcomes. And then all the way over on the right side of the screen, you can see that these then translate into negative maternal outcomes, infant developmental outcomes, family outcomes. So things that we're all pretty familiar with in the work that we do. Um, but I would recommend this is a nice I'm getting a little bit dated now, but a nice review to go back and see like some of the existing literature that really supports the connection across these different threads. Um, so a little bit, you know, anytime we're giving a talk or thinking about like something as a public health problem, we have to think about the scope of the problem. And so I like to point out um, to those who may not realize that actually 50% of pregnant women in the United States uh, receive their health coverage through Medicaid, and that one out of eight U.S. babies are born here in California. And so it gives you a sense of if we collectively transform the way that we deliver health care um, and think about the underlying social determinants of health during pregnancy for um, women on Medicaid, we could actually have a really profound impact on our public health as a nation. Um, the other thing that's on this slide is this is data at the state level, the California state level, from the maternal infant health assessment, the MEHA data. And what this slide shows, and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone in this room, but basically, I didn't get a pointer, but that's fine. So you're looking here at a dose response of how maternal or prenatal depressive symptoms are related to poverty and related to a host of other adverse, negative, psychological outcomes. So just to walk you through a little bit, on the far column is the most, the highest level of poverty, so those living at less than 100% of the poverty level. And there you see that among, the, in that group, approximately 24% of women report having prenatal depressive symptoms. And then the levels of depression go down as you basically have more income. And then similarly, all the other things that we know in our day-to-day -day clinical work are associated with prenatal depressive symptoms such as um, food insecurity or uh, job loss or the birth outcomes that I mentioned earlier. All of those also have a dose response when it comes to poverty. Um, so scope of disparities. This is national data looking at the rate of preterm births. Whoops, still there? Okay. Looking at the rate of preterm births um, in 2013, and this is really pretty much unchanged. So what you see here in the green column is our non-Hispanic black population. Um, and you see this significant contrast, um, particularly with the non-Hispanic white population, which is in the furthest blue column. So again, just demonstrating that this is not a question only of great public health scope, it's also a question that has significant disparities across race, ethnicity, and SES. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dr. Michael Liu and Neil Halfon. They have done amazing work around um, maternal disparities, and they're the ones um, they didn't introduce the life course perspective, but they helped to think about the life course perspective in relationship to birth outcomes in particular. And so I like this slide conceptually to help us think about what might be some of the reasons for those racial and ethnic disparities that we see. We know that it's not about genetics and it's not about biological differences across the races, what it could be, and most likely is, and all the science tells us, is that it's actually about a difference in risk factors and protective factors over the life course. And so what this slide shows, it's just a schematic demonstration of if you're living in the United States for the most part and you have the privilege of white skin, then you, your reproductive potential and therefore the life course 
of your infant is more likely to follow this higher black line. And the reason for that is just simply that you are more likely to have a greater number of protective factors and, a, and less risk factors. And that's contrasted here um, with the more likely life course of an African-American trajectory. Um, so I told you that we would be going back and forth, uh, toggling a little bit between some of the science and some of my personal trajectories. So I feel like um, my, uh, really my life course, so to speak, and my career was changed quite a bit when I had the privilege of rotating through OB psychiatry as a resident. Um, and at that time, Dr. Anna Spielvogel and Dr. Gloria Castro, who are here in the audience, um, really were spearheading this amazing um, model of treatment. So um, what happens in the OB psychiatry clinic um, is a co-location and increasingly integration of mental health services by psychiatrists, psychologists, um, social workers with more traditional OB care. So we work side by side in the Women's Health Center. And I had the privilege of rotating through there as a resident. Um, and I also had the privilege of exploring a study question or a research project as a resident within that clinic. And that basic question was, do those well-established racial and ethnic disparities in birth outcomes that we were talking about a few minutes ago still exist in a setting like San Francisco General where all of the women have pretty substantial psychosocial risk? And the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, so not terribly surprising, but it was surprising that in a pretty small sample, about 200 women, we were able to statistically demonstrate a difference between our African-American birth outcomes when compared to those of Caucasian or white women in our sample. Um, so this is just a table copied over from um, that study and basically what you're looking at here is exactly what I just said that whether we're looking at gestational age or looking at birth weight that black women who deliver infants here at San Francisco General are more likely than their white counterparts to deliver babies early and to deliver them at a lower birth weight. What was really an interesting finding here is that these were not these were not um, specific across uh, mental health diagnoses, that it was really just across the board that the racial disparities stood out. So as I said, our findings mirrored the national findings. And um, I was finishing up my residency, and I was having my first baby, and I was thinking about, well, what do these findings tell us, and what might we think about next um, if we were to do more studies or to develop other programs? Um, so I put this slide up because I think um, doing that little study and also having the clinical experience in the OB psychiatry clinic was really a bit of a wake-up call for me as a young psychiatrist um, to think about our mental health in the broader context of our of, of social context and so this is a nice slide that really highlights um, again you see sort of the little circle is preterm birth low birth weight infant more individual outcomes and then they sort of say you know let's not forget that that's nested in the parent and the family which is then nested in community and society and the other thing that i really appreciate is they also really call out very explicitly that those things are also nested within the historical context of racism um, this is maya angelou for those of you that don't recognize her um, and i am going to take this moment to read a quote from her um, it was a few years ago I was reading her all the different biographical autobiographical books um, that she wrote and I came across and one of them called singing and swinging and getting married like Christmas is the title of the book that she actually went to our very own Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute at some point in her life, and she writes about that. Um, and I thought that this uh, actually provides an interesting frame for my, the rest of my talk. So I'm gonna quote Maya Angelou here. I started to cry. Yes, I was troubled. Why else would I be here? But what could I tell this man? 
Would he understand Arkansas, which I left, yet would never, could never leave? Would he comprehend why my brilliant brother, who was the genius in our family, was doing time in Sing Sing on a charge of fencing stolen goods <coughs> instead of sitting with clean fingernails in a tailor-made suit, listening to some poor mad person cry her blues out? How would he perceive a mother who, in a desperate thrust for freedom, left her only child who became sick during her absence? A mother who, upon her return, felt so guilty she could think of nothing more productive than killing herself and possibly even the child. I looked at the doctor and he looked at me, saying nothing, waiting. I used up my Kleenex and took more from my purse. No, I couldn't tell him about living inside a skin that was hated or feared by the majority of one's fellow citizens or about the sensation of getting on a bus on a lovely morning, feeling happy, and suddenly seeing the passengers curl their lips in distaste or avert their eyes in revulsion. No, I had nothing to say to the doctor. I stood up. So the reason I titled this particular slide, Recognizing Limitations, is that I feel like recognizing my own limitations as a white person, as a person of privilege, um, has been really important in helping me um, develop the work that I develop in concert with many of you and, and has helped me to think very differently about how we might um, more successfully support the families um, that we see and and you know as part of the frame of that I bring limitations and so um, I took that in some ways to mean oh maybe I should get some more training <laughs> um, which is what many of us do um, and so I at this point I went and I did a postdoc with Nancy Adler um, and we started looking at uh, I was involved as a postdoc with a study called the MAMA study, um, which stands for Maternal Adiposity, Metabolism, and Stress. And the reason I bring this up is because one of the things that I really took away from my involvement with this study and from the findings, which I'll share some of with them with you, is that um, it was really great that the group I was working with, Nancy and Alyssa Apple and others, recognized that before developing an intervention, that we should actually start with the women who we might hope to serve and get some opinions from them and get actual input about their lives and what they might be interested in. Um, and so this is just a slide basically describing that um, in order to inform the development that this was a mindful, mindfulness-based study um, looking at impact on gestational weight gain, um, that we went back and we did some focus groups with 59 low-income, overweight, and obese women who participated in the focus groups. Um, and here's what they said. None of this is exactly surprising or rocket science, but I like to bring at the actual voices in when I can. So um, it's so obvious the connection between stress and food in my life. Like my husband will call me and he'll be like, well, my paycheck was actually $100 less than we thought it was going to be. So we might not be able to pay G&E this month, but we'll do something else. And my first reaction is like, I just need to go eat something. Like, how is that going to help anything? Eating a bowl of ice cream is not going to help me keep my electrical bill on. Uh, another woman said, does stress cause me to eat more? Yes, it does. I can take down a whole box of ho-hos and a half gallon of milk, but it doesn't really make you feel better. It just makes you feel at ease for the moment. So I'm moving on kind of quickly through this, but um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the actual mindfulness-based intervention when um, this study occurred is that um, some of the key things that we found. So first of all, the intervention, the mindfulness-based intervention did show some positive effects on depression and stress, even though that wasn't actually the primary outcome we were looking at. Secondly, we found, again, not surprisingly, that recruitment and retention were very difficult. 
Uh, third, women were engaged, but they also had significant competing priorities. Um, there was no actual impact on gestational weight gain, uh, but there were some promising intergenerational effects, and uh, Dr. Nikki Bush, who's in our department, was the PI of the SEED study, who, which is um, ongoing, and she's now looking at some of that data in greater detail. So for me, although I loved my time as a postdoc, it was really the only time since I completed my residency that I was not directly connected here at ZSFG. And I realized for myself as I thought about what next and as I thought about some of what I had learned um, through my involvement with the MAMA study and some of those like findings that I shared with you is that I really wanted to be grounded in a more clinical work in a healthcare delivery system and so I found my way, not surprisingly, back here um, to San Francisco General. Um, so ZSFG has in many ways always kind of felt like home to me um, and that therefore I put the picture back up of ZSFG um, and also the True North um, which is the hospital's description of their overarching goals. And what I love about this is that um, they call out the patient and community at the top um, and that care experience and equity are listed specifically and called out as, as True North goals. Um, so coming back to ZSFG and thinking about that idea of competing priorities and social determinants of health. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Dr. Angela Narayan and Gloria Castro and Alicia Lieberman um, in a study that was conducted a few years back. This paper is from 2017 and I can't remember exactly when we recruited this sample. This was about, again, about 200 women, all of whom were planning to deliver their infants at San Francisco General. And um, Angela, Melissa Rivera, and Dr. Castro, and others did a, an amazing job of um, talking through the, a variety of surveys and interview questions with these women. And one of the things that we asked about were ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and so this slide really highlights in a random sample of women planning to deliver their infants here at this hospital, the prevalence of ACEs that we have. Um, so again, for those of you that, that do work here, these numbers are probably not surprising at all. Um, we can see that 47% of women said they had experienced emotional abuse. 35% um, said they had experienced sexual abuse. And the list just kind of goes on and on. Um, so someone earlier, and I'm, I know I've met you before, but I don't remember your name, um, brought up ACEs and I said, oh, you could come and give my talk. So here we are um, talking about the impact of ACEs. Is everyone in the room familiar with the concept of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences? I'm seeing nods. Who will talk about it for me? No one, no one wants to talk about you. Yeah, perfect. So I don't know how much of that translates to those of you listening or watching elsewhere. Um, but basically, it was just a lovely summary, thank you, showing that ACEs are adverse childhood experiences have lasting impacts on a host of different health outcomes. So socio-emotional development outcomes, more traditional medical outcomes, various behaviors, and also things that can be described as sort of life potential graduation rates, academic achievement, that sort of thing. 
Um, this is another slide sort of demonstrating um, ways to think about another concept, toxic stress, which is well known to many of us, and ACEs together. So what I like about this slide is that it really calls out the significance of buffering from a supportive adult, right? So if we think about the negative impact of ACEs, and we all probably would want to um, prevent adverse childhood experiences from ever happening in the first place. So while we're carrying that very important activism thread, we might also think about how might we in our day-to-day -day clinical work also help to prevent the effects of toxic stress. And one of the ways that we do that is um, by helping to support a caregiver in the child's life. Um, so when I, when I think about caregivers, um, I tend to think about moms. They're the ones that most often show up in our OB psychiatry clinic and most often are the ones who on the pediatric side bring their babies for care. So when I talk about what do moms want, I don't necessarily mean to exclude other significant caregivers, um, but I do feel like at least in our day-to-day -day clinical work here, most often it is, is the moms that we're interacting with. Um, so this slide uh, is here to demonstrate the window of opportunity in a really interesting way. And so um, because I did a postdoc with Nancy Adler, I was exposed to this tool which she developed, which is the subjective stress, subjective social stress ladder. And so basically the way that you think about this is you ask people, um, and this is on the, on the left, where would you place yourself on this ladder right now compared to everyone else in the United States? And people can choose. And then you can ask, in this case, we asked, where do you imagine your baby will be on this ladder when he or she is your age compared to everyone else in the United States? And so the slide really speaks for itself. Um, and this was uh, just, a ran again, a random sample of about 20 postpartum moms here at San Francisco General. And I think it's just a really nice illustration of like these moms see hope they see excitement and they feel empowered um, to create positive lives for their infants. Um, I'm gonna zip forward a little bit more. This is a paper that we wrote again with um, colleagues here. So Dr. Gloria Castro, Dr. Anna Spielvogel, one of our um, OB colleagues, Margie Hutchison where we put together a demonstration of what are some of the existing services that we have here in San Francisco General. We called it Meeting Women Where They Are, Integration of Care is the Foundation of Treatment for At-Risk Pregnant and Postpartum Women. And what we called out here in this slide is the importance of recognizing that um, women will have different needs and so not everyone will either need to or want to see a psychiatrist, <laughs> for example, um, but that many, if not all, of our women would benefit from community-based assistance with social needs, social support, and highlighting a little bit here our partnership with the Homeless Prenatal Program. I'm gonna skip this slide and jump ahead. So um, the Homeless Prenatal Program is a dreamy community-based organization that I have been privileged to partner with and I know many of you in the room have worked with them as well um, and a couple years back I uh, worked with folks at HPP the homeless prenatal program to do a little bit of a needs assessment from clients that they see and what are the mental health maternal mental health needs that clients and providers at HPP identify and what are some of the ideas that they might have clients and providers at a community-based organization that might help us to inform development of, of various programs and services here so I'm going to walk you through this needs assessment just a little bit so we had 39 client participants, these were focus groups again. 51% um, of them were pregnant, 33% were first time moms, 48% born outside of the United States, and you can see a breakdown of the race and ethnic diversity um, in the pie chart. 
Um, one thing I want to point out is we asked women to fill out the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale um, as a part of this focus group needs assessment study, and 38% of these women screened positive for depression. Um, we haven't published this manuscript yet, but maybe one day we will. Um, but what we found as we read through the focus groups, and this was done, a lot of this work was done by a medical student, Snehal Murthy. Um, and what we found as we read through these focus groups, and this sort of ties in with some of what we've talked about earlier, is that clients at the homeless prenatal program, not surprisingly, did not think about their mental health needs in isolation, right? So we wanted to talk with them about their mental health needs, and what we heard about was all these things sort of surrounding this perinatal depression bubble. So again, sort of back in the words of the women that we spoke to from the clients. I have been now doing housing workshops for the last six months. I'm getting letters back from places, but they're telling me I have to wait. I'm on the list. I'm on every list you can be on. But is there going to be any like support or help where I can come and be like, hey, this is everything I got. Where do I go from here? Second woman said, I was very picky and cautious on what I told any doctor that I saw for prenatal care. Because the worst thing for a doctor to do is write down that you use drugs because every single medical provider that I've ever encountered looks at you instantly and assumes that you're going to relapse. They don't care that it has been four or five or six years since you ever did anything. It doesn't matter what you have worked on, what you've accomplished in your life. It doesn't matter if you have a career, you're a drug addict. Um, so these are some from some of the providers at HPP. I'm just going to read through these quickly. For mental health, what I hear people say all the time is that someone is stressed, independent of what the cause is. It could be homelessness, it could be a lack of resources or whatever. But when they come through, when they get to us, most of the time it is, I'm stressed or I'm having difficulty navigating the system, some difficulty in parenting. There are a lot of people with primary anxiety and depression or PTSD, but then there is a large group of people that are just having a really hard time with things. Another provider put it this way, mothers don't prioritize the need for therapy because they are more focused on what they are going to eat for that day or where they will sleep, so it's not their priority. Um, so I'm gonna close my talk with an introduction to the Solid Start program. Um, Solid Start is an initiative that came about several years ago here at San Francisco General. Um, and Solid Start is what I would describe a private, public, community, academic partnership. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, basically the story of Solid Start is that a private couple in the San Francisco community decided that it was what they wanted to do with their life legacy to give back to pregnant women and families with young children, and they approached the San Francisco General Hospital Foundation with this vision in mind. The San Francisco General Hospital Foundation wisely pulled together leadership from multiple departments. Um, so to focus on this idea of pre to three and to create a vision around that specific population, they pulled in people from psychiatry and OB and family medicine and pediatrics. And over much, much, much discussion <laughs> at multiple levels in the hospital, um, some of which I was privileged to be a part of, um, the vision of the Solid Start initiative was born. Um, so I, I put this slide up because this is a slide demonstrating return on investment. So why might business people think that they would want to put money into pre to three? Well, most of us who work with this population know the answer to that. We know that not only is it a good thing to do, but it's a smart thing to do if you're thinking from a business standpoint. And so these particular philanthropic couple recognized both the sort of um, compassionate, empathic piece of wanting to give back to their community, and they also felt that this was a wise investment of their money. Um, and so Solid Start was born. 
um, the Solid Start scope. So the vision of Solid Start is not to recreate the wheel. Um, we have the opportunity here at San Francisco General with about 1,200 births, 5,000 families with children aged zero to three. The steering committee is across the four departments that I mentioned earlier. Um, a variety of pre-existing services. Some of you work in those pre-existing services. Um, the UCSF affiliation, so many, many possibilities associated with this loose and large vision that is the Solid Start initiative. This is our mission statement with Solid Start. So you can see here with a little picture, the idea is to really think about that intersection of behavioral health, social needs, and medical needs. And you can see how some of my own earlier experiences and earlier work um, makes me feel really passionate about the intersection of, of those three things. So the Solid Start initiative is ESFG promotes health and health equity by developing, implementing, and evaluating comprehensive and family-centered care for pregnant women and families with young children. So piece of cake, right? Um, the vision is that we would work across traditional silos. Um, many of these silos are come from our medical lens of having OB care, pediatric care, the departments that aren't necessarily integrated with each other, and then also divides of prenatal care, your birth center care, and then your pediatric care, often being by completely different departments in different locations and providers that may or may not um, normally communicate with each other. So someone once told me, they said, oh, Solid Start is like a startup. And I was thinking about that. And I really decided that I do not believe that Solid Start is like a startup, for the most part. Um, I do think that Solid Start is potentially innovative. That's like a solid, that's like a startup. Um, but I think that we are much more like a mosaic table. Um, and I use that uh, sort of, what's the right word? I use that as a way to describe Solid Start thinking. Basically, like we have the hospital and DPH can be like the backbone for the actual table that the mosaic tiles sit upon, right? The structure of the table is already in place. And there are many amazing programs. You can see some of the different programs that we partner with listed there that are already in place. So the idea is not to create new programs, but to think about how the different pieces of these programs might actually fit together and link together in a cohesive and comprehensive patient-centered way. So again, trying to get outside of those silos or those divides between your in prenatal care, your in pediatric care, and think about how it might be felt from the family experience. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to describe Solid Start. <laughs> People, programs, and partnerships and also to think about we're not trying to change something quickly, we're trying to change a system over the long haul to make it more patient-centered and family-centered. So coming back to the partnership with the Homeless Prenatal Program, and we've had the opportunity to move from that sort of conceptual needs assessment piece that I talked about a little bit earlier to a pilot intervention. Um, what we've been doing is having community health workers, two community health workers who are actually employed by HPP, the Homeless Prenatal Program, um, work with us here on site in the OB Psychiatry Clinic to really concretely bridge the mental health services and medical services provided here at the hospital and the social needs services provided by the Homeless Prenatal Program. Um, the pilot phase of this project was funded by the Preterm Birth Initiative. Um, it was a two-year initial pilot grant, which we just wrapped up. And um, now this pilot is continued to be funded by the Solid Start Initiative. A little bit of background on community health workers and why community health workers. Um, they've been shown to be more effective than clinical providers at eliciting psychosocial needs for low-income women. 
Um, and then there was also a really interesting study that paired community health workers with nurse home visitors. I love I love nurse home visiting programs. Um, but they they found that by pairing CHWs with the home visiting programs, you actually improve depressive symptoms compared to the home visiting intervention on its own. So why not CHWs <laughs> um, would be my question. So this is a little bit of a description for how um, we've conceptualized this program. So pregnant women are identified by us in the OB psychiatry clinic as having social needs that are, ha are not being met and they're interested in um, meeting with our community health workers to talk about the homeless prenatal program. The community health workers meet with the family to assess their needs, sometimes separately from the clinical providers, sometimes alongside the clinical providers. We describe ourselves as team-based care, that we all want to work together um, to support the family in any way that we can. And then the family is followed across um, with the perinatal health navigators over to HPP and back and forth between OB psychiatry and, and the homeless prenatal program. Um, here's what some of our clinicians, uh, social workers and doctors said about the experience of having community health workers here. So uh, Gabby and Maisha, they are our CHWs, I wish they were here today to speak for themselves. Um, so someone said they have really enhanced the connection and mutual understanding between patients and providers. They link patients to services at homeless prenatal in a way that is so much more powerful than a simple referral. Somebody else, one of our social workers said, Gabby and Maisha have been a crucial link in developing robust multidisciplinary team support for the patients within the clinic and in the broader community. And another doctor said, having CHWs embedded in the clinic has made a huge difference in the lives of our patients. They bring an increased sense of connected, connectedness to the community, stabilizing sometimes chaotic lives with connection to much needed resources. Also, Gabby has really helped me in connecting to Spanish speaking patients. This is Gabby and Maisha. Um, <laughs> I see cheering out there. I know, I love them too, so much. Um, so this is some of our preliminary data. Um, more than 40 women um, who were seen here at OB Psych then attended a wellness orientation that they developed over at HPP. Um, the CHWs have worked with more than 25 individual patients in the OB psychiatry clinic. This was over the first six months of the program. Um, often we would have clinicians and clients come looking for the community health workers. Um, my favorite story about this, actually Gloria, I think one of them involves you, where you were over at the birth center and someone, one of the patients was actually asking for Gabby by name and you came over and found her and took her back over, which was really lovely. Um, and Gabby has gone back to school, Maisha is making some plans. So one of the other things I've really loved about being involved with this is the actual really deep professional development that has been able to occur in the lives of Gabby and Maisha as well. Um, a little bit of a preview for anybody that's interested in hearing more about Solid Start, um, please ask me more. So we are getting epic here in the hospital. I'm sure many of you have heard about that. Um, I actually am really excited that it's going to help make our lives a little bit easier in terms of care coordination and integration across departments and services. Um, also, we're starting a Solid Start Family Advisory Board in a way so that we can have an ongoing way of bringing the, not only the voices but the actual partnership with uh, the families that we serve into our program development and ongoing program strategy. Um, and then eventually in the old hospital building as they're renovating, we will have a Solid Start space, um, with, which we are calling the Solid Start Family Resource Center, which will be a way for families to actually go and work with navigators or see someone from some of the other amazing programs that are here on campus. Um, I forgot to put this in here. Um, so let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'll go through this real quick. Um, so also just a little bit of a shout out to other research efforts. Um, so uh, this is a maternal mental health stakeholder engagement grant that we have here um, at UCSF. It's been Corey funded 
Um, you can see by our little, little catchy acronym, um, we're calling it San Francisco Embraces. So engaging with mothers and others to bolster research and create effective solutions for maternal mental health. Through, through this effort, we've been able to host a few different convenings. I think some of you have been at that, some of them, um, to really um, sort of bust open the stakeholder dialogue around like what would effective services for maternal mental health in this county look like? Um, and so really sort of trying to think about how would we pull together the social services and DPH efforts and some of the programs at UCSF to really better um, serve both the actual clinical needs but also do patient-centered research for this population focused on maternal mental health. Um, I also have to just give out a quick advocacy shout out to my um, collaborator, Joy Burkhard with 2020 Mom. So along with many others, um, I worked with her last year on some maternal mental health state legislation. Um, so for those of you that don't know, California just last year on his way out, Willie Brown, um, not Willie Brown, Jerry Brown, thank you, um, signed some really significant legislation which will give us an opportunity um, to implement some novel changes in maternal mental health. I'm happy to talk about that more. Um, I want to make sure to leave time for questions and people to get to their one o'clock um, thing. So I want to thank uh, those of you in the audience again for listening. I want to thank all the people who have partnered over the years and mentors who have been patient with my um, trajectory. Um, and then of course I can't give a talk without having a picture of my kiddos up there. Um, this was a rare moment when they're snuggling and not hitting each other. Um, yeah, so thank you all very much. I'm happy to answer questions.